Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 23rd of the 11th month, with also, which also lines up with the 4th of February, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're going to take a little break from the Book of Hanok today. There's some discrepancies with the sections coming up that I'm trying to go over so we can get the most accurate version to read through. But um, we're going to segue here to the apostolic constitutions and this is a section that's called on heresies it's fairly long but it literally covers all the heretical or the errant things that were brought and mixed in with his word and his covenant throughout time since it was given so it's very profitable to go over and to learn it helps us to figure out what things are of the truth and what things are not this is from book seven of the apostolic constitutions and i believe it goes through um, sections one through five but this is section one on heresies who they were that ventured to make schisms and did not escape punishment it says above all things overseers avoid the sad and dangerous and most atheistical heresies issuing which means casting away from you in shewing them as fire that burns those that come near to it. Avoid also schisms, for it is neither lawful to turn one's mind towards wicked heresies, nor to separate from those of the same sentiment out of ambition. For some who ventured to set up such practices of old did not escape punishment. For Datham and Abiram, who set up in opposition to Moshe, were swallowed up into the earth. But Korach and those 250 who with him raised a sedition against Aharon or Aaron were consumed by fire. Now, if you're not familiar with this section, we'll get to it. But this was during the wilderness journey while they were in between going from Mitzrayim into the promised land where they were spending the 40 years in exile because of the uh, waywardness of the people. Ten times he tried them and ten times they failed or they, they grieved him by disobedience or complaining, grumbling, not following what he said to do. And so the punishment for those people was that they would, as they said, it would be done to them. They would die in the wilderness, but their children got to go into the promised land. So after they were given that punishment, while they were wandering in the wilderness, excuse me, wilderness, they rose up a sedition against Moshe. Datham and Abiram were both sons of Reuben, the tribe of Reuben. And Korach was of the sons of Louis. And these are also foreshadowing things that would happen in the future, where you had the Kohanim or the priest caste rise up with some of Reuben. And this is what would be, uh, Reuben was the one who slept with his father's concubine or wife and defiled his bed right it it's reminiscent of france and what france and catholicism did contrary to the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad right but that's for another time this is a foreshadow of those things though it says miriam also who reproached moshe was cast out of the camp for seven days for she said that moshe had taken an ethiopian to wife and this is numbers chapter 12 you won't find this in the common scriptures where he actually married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, Zephora is a, a daughter of, of, of a son of Midian who's of Yishmael. But when you look in Josephus and you read about the antiquities of the Yahudim, before Moshe rose up to be a deliverer of the people, he was raised in Pharaoh's courts, if you will. And they had a foretelling that he would be the one that would destroy them. So they tried to kill him off by having him go fight Egypt's enemies as the general of the army. And he was successful in overcoming the Ethiopians. One city that he was sent to destroy, the, the daughter of the king there said, I'll let you in if you marry me. And he agreed. So he had married an Ethiopian woman that way. But that's never mentioned anywhere in the common scriptures. However, Miriam does talk about that so it's it's alluded to but it's not spoken of like how it came about 
But this is nay. In the case of Azar Yahu and Uzi Yahu, 2 Chronicles 26, the latter of which was king of Yahuda, but venturing to usurp the kahuna and desiring to offer incense, which it is not lawful for him to do, was hindered by Azar Yahu the high Kohen, and the fourscore Kohenim, or eighty Kohenim. And when he would not obey, he found the leprosy to arise in his forehead, and he hastened to go out, because Yahuwah had reproved him. And it was at that time there was a massive earthquake that was foretold. It's also talked about as the earthquake that happened during this time. Something like that will happen again when our Mashiach comes to stand on Mount or on the mountain. I believe it mentions that somewhere. But there was a massive earthquake when he did that. He tried to offer incense, and then the light struck through. And when it hit him, he had leprosy on him. All right. It is not lawful to rise up either against the kingly or the Kohanim office. This is another theme that you'll also see in the Testaments of Louis and Yahuda, and pretty much the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs in general. They all mention to follow Yahuda as the king and Louis as the Kohen. It says, Let us therefore, beloved, consider what sort of esteem that of the seditious is and what their condemnation. For if he that rises up against kings is worthy of punishment, even though he be a son or a friend, how much more he that rises up against the Kohanim? For by how much the Kahuna is more noble than the royal power, as having its concern about the nefesh, or soul, inner being, so much has he a greater punishment who ventures to oppose the kahuna, which in English you'd say priesthood, okay? Then he who ventures to oppose the royal power, although neither of them goes unpunished. For neither did Absalom nor Abadan, Second Samuel, that's 18 through 20, For neither did Absalom or, nor Abadan, or Abadan, these are two sons of Dawid, right, escape without punishment, nor Korok and Datham, Numbers 16. The former rose against Dawid and strove concerning the kingdom, the latter against Moshe concerning preeminence, and they both spoke evil. Absalom of his father Dawid, as of an unrighteous arbitrator or judge, saying to everyone, Your words are good, but there is no one that will hear you and do you right ruling. Who will make me a ruler? Second Samuel 15.3 Yet Abdan, or Abdaddan said, I have no part in Dawid, nor any inheritance in the son of Yeshai. And that's 2 Samuel 20 verse 1. It is plain that he could not endure to be under Dawid's government. I believe this is of this is someone of the tribe of Dan or Benjamin. I think it's the tribe of Dan, though. Sorry about that. This is it is plain that he could not endure to be under Dawid's government, of whom Elohim spoke. Quote, I have found Dawid, the son of Yeshai, a man after my heart, who will do all my commands. Acts 13.22 But Datham and Abiram and the followers of Korok said to Moshe, Is it a small thing that you have brought us out of the land of Egypt or Mitzrayim, out of a land flowing with milk and honey? And why have you put out our eyes? And will you rule over us? Unquote. And they gathered together against him a great congregation. And the followers of Korok said, Has Elohim spoke alone to Moshe? Why is it that he has given the high kahuna to Aharon alone? Is not all the congregation of Yahuwah set apart? And why is Aharon alone possessed of the kahuna? And before this one said, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Exodus 2.14 
This is concerning the virtue of Moshe and the incredulity of the Yahudi nation and what wonderful works Elohim did among them. And they raised a sedition against Moshe, the servant of El, the meekest of all men. Numbers 12.3 And trustworthy, and affronted so great a man with the highest ingratitude, who was their lawgiver and guardian and high Kohen and king, the administrator of El breathed things, one that showed as a creator the mighty works of the creator, the meekest man, freest from arrogance and full of fortitude, and most benign in his temper, one who had delivered them from many dangers and freed them from several deaths by his set apartness, who had done so many signs and wonders from Elohim before the people, and had performed splendorous and wonderful works for their benefit who had brought the ten plagues upon the Egyptians, who had divided the Red Sea, and had separated the waters as a wall on this side and on that side, and had led the people through them as through a dry wilderness, and a drowned Pharaoh and the Mitzrayim, and all that were in company with them, and had made the fountain sweet for them with wood, and had brought water out of the stony rock for them when they were thirsty, and had given them manna out of the Shemaim, and had distributed flesh to them out of the air, and had afforded them a pillar of fire in the night to enlighten their con er, and conduct them, and a pillar of cloud to shadow them in the day by reason of the violent heat of the sun and had exhibited to them the Torah of Elohim, engraven from the mouth and hand and writing of El, in tables of stone, the perfect number of ten commandments, to whom Elohim spoke face to face as if a man spoke to his friend, of whom he said, and there, was not, and there arose not a foreteller like Moshe. And all of that is written, if you keep in mind how our Mashiach actually was, this is what it said, there shall arise a foreteller like unto you in all things, and him they shall listen to. He was the meekest of all men. He's the one that through his set of partners, he said he saved the people from death several times. All of those things apply to our Mashiach, who is doing these things through Moshe as a type and shadow, because he is the truth. And like he said, as I see, so I do. As I hear, so I say. Right? This is against him arose the followers of Korach and the Reubenites, and threw stones at Moshe, who prayed and said, Accept not their offering. And the esteem of Elohim appeared, and sent down some into the earth, and burnt up others with fire. And so... As to those ringleaders of the schismatical deceit, which said, let us make ourselves a leader. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their tents and what appertained to them. And they went down alive into hell or the grave. But he destroyed the followers of Korok with fire. Section 2. History and Doctrines of Heresies. That schism is made not by him who separates himself from the unrighteous, but who departs from the righteous. If, therefore, Elohim inflicted punishment immediately on those that made a schism on account of their ambition, how much rather will he do it upon those who are the leaders of impious heresies? And this is specifically about the Gnostics, Simon the Magician, and the other heretics heretical opinions that have been brought up and caused issues like what nicholas did one of the seven ministers that were chosen who later went apostate and started the nicolaitan movement will not he inflict severer punishment on those that blaspheme his providence or his creation yet you brethren who are instructed out of the scriptures should take care not to make divisions in opinion nor divisions in unity. 
For those who set up unlawful opinions are marks of perdition to the tribes or peoples. In like manner, you of the laity should not come near, or you of the people, that's what laity means, should not come near to such as advance doctrines contrary to the mind of Elohim, nor should you be partakers of their impiety. For, says Elohim, separate yourselves from the midst of these men, lest you perish together with them. And again, depart from the midst of them and separate yourselves, says Yahuwah, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It says, upon what account Yisrael, falsely so named, is rejected by Elohim, demonstrated from the foretold predictions. Now, these are titles made by the authors that wrote it later, not what was originally in the text. But Yisrael, if you recall, means he who strives with men in El and overcomes. And it is also the prince of El, or he is a prince of El. And both of those were not true to the people who rejected walking according to his will. It says, for those are most certainly to be avoided who blaspheme Elohim. The greatest part of the unrighteous indeed are ignorant of Elohim. But these men, as fighters against Elohim, are possessed with a willful evil disposition, as with a disease. For from the wickedness of these heretics, pollution is gone out upon all the earth, says, as says the foreteller, Yeremiyahu. For the wicked synagogue is now cast off by Yahuwah Elohim, and his house is rejected by him, as he somewhere speaks, I have forsaken mine house, I have left mine inheritance. And again, Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah says, I will neglect my vineyard, and it shall not be pruned nor dug, and thorns shall spring up upon it, as upon a desert, and I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Yeshiyahu 5 6. And that was foretelling both the captivity of mystery or of Babylon when it was destroyed and laid fallow for 70 years. And then later on, after Rome had came, the mystery Babylon did the same thing, and it was a desert wasteland and uninhabited for his from his people for quite a long time. Which both the casting away and their restoration are both foretold in Revelation. It period it was in the stars and how it happened is all laid out there. I highly encourage everyone to look up the Antichrist for Dummies video series and, and learn about how that actually worked and played out in history. He has therefore left his people as a tent in the vineyard, and as a gardener in a fig or olive yard, and as a besieged city. Yeshayahu 1 8. He has taken away from them the set apart ruach and the foretelling rain, and has replenished his assembly with spiritual favor, as the river of Egypt in the time of first fruits and has advanced the same as a house upon a hill or as a high mountain, as a mountain fruitful for milk and fatness, wherein it has pleased Elohim to dwell. For Yahuwah will inhabit therein to the end. And he says, In Yeremiyahu, our sanctuary is an exalted throne of esteem. That's Yeremiyahu 17, 12. And he says in Yeshiyahu, And it shall come to pass in the last days, and remember, it was the last days were upon us when our Mashiach started, when he came. He was talking about that, and it's the last days of the creation week, as it was foretold from the beginning, all of history until the millennial reign right there. This is, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahuwah shall be splendorous, and the house of Yahuwah shall be upon the top of the mountains, meaning the height of the kingdoms of the world, and shall be advanced above the hills. Yeshayahu 2, verse 2. 
Since, therefore, he has forsaken his people, he has also left his temple desolate, and rent the veil of the temple, and took from them the set-apart ruach. For, says he, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And he also said, You shall by no means see me again until you say, Baruch is he who comes in the Shem, or name of Yahuwah. And he has bestowed upon you, the converted of the nations, spiritual favor, as he says by Yahuel, or what they call Joel. It shall come to pass after these things, says Elohim, that I will pour out my ruach upon all flesh, and your sons shall foretell, and your daughters shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Yahuel 2.28 for Elohim has taken away all the power and efficacy of his word and such like visitations from that people and has transferred it to you, the converted of the nations. Meaning he took it from those who rejected him of the tribe of Yahuda that were in the land and he gave it to the ones that were doing his will everywhere that they dwelt. For on this account, the devil himself is very angry at the set-apart assembly of Elohim. He is removed to you and has raised against you adversities, seditions, and reproaches, schisms, and heresies. For he had before subdued that people to himself by, slaying of, or by their slaying of Mashiach. But you who have left his van vanities, he tempts in different ways as he did the Baruch Job. And that would be Job for anyone that doesn't know. For indeed he opposed that great high Kohen, Yahushua, the son of Yahu Zadok, from Zakar Yahu 3, verse 1. And he oftentimes sought to sift us, that our belief might fail. But our Yahuwah and Master, having brought him to trial, said to him, Yahuwah rebuke you, O devil, and Yahuwah who has chosen Yerushalayim rebuke you. Is not this plucked out of the fire as a brand? And who said then to those that stood by the high Kohen, Take away his ragged garments from him, and added, Behold, I have taken your inequities away from you. He will now say, or sorry, he will say now, as he said formerly of us when we were assembled together, I have prayed that your belief may not fail. Luke 22, 32. That even among the Yahudim, there arose doctrines of several heresies hateful to Elohim. For even the Yahudi nation had wicked heresies for of them were the Sadducees, who do not believe or confess the resurrection of the dead, and the Pharisees, who ascribe the practice of sinners to fortune and fate, or fortune and fate, like what they do with astrology, or thinking that things are just random. And the Bathmonians or Basmothians who deny providence, that would be the, the Baptists, right? I, I'm not saying that word right. I think it came out wrong when I transferred that. So who denied providence and say that the world is made by spontaneous motion or what they'd call the Big Bang Theory. And take away the immorality, immoral or sorry, and take away the immortality of the inner being or soul. And the Hermio Baptists, who every day, unless they wash, do not eat. Nay, and unless they cleanse their beds and tables, or platters and cups and seats, do not make use of any of them. And those who are newly risen among us, the Ebionites who will have the son of Elohim to be a mere man, begotten by man's pleasure, and the conjunction of Yahusuf and Miriam. So this was a heretical opinion that was going on back in that time, and it's also something that's prevalent. Unfortunately, in more modern times, there's a lot of people who've 
taken up those positions and beliefs contrary to the truth, which is another reason why it's good to read this and study it for ourselves. There are also those that separate themselves from all these and observe the laws of their fathers, and these are the Essenes. Now, the Essenes were never called such by believers during that time. The section that was quoted in Josephus that mentions the Essenes, the Hebrew actually says heretics. But they call it, it was the Pharisees that called them heretics. And one of the Essenes was foretelling the rise of Herod as the king over the people before it happened. He's also, um, he also ended up, he's mentioned in the book of Acts, but he became a believer and one of the prominent, eminent men that were teaching people outside of the land there. There was a gentleman, um, I'll have to link it in the description, but I don't remember. There was a gentleman who was doing a study on how you can find the proof of our Mashiach in the Talmud. And while they tried everything they could to hide these things and not talk about him at all, they mentioned people who are also mentioned in scripture that became believers. One of them, and the, the gentleman that I'm thinking of, he was head of the Sanhedrin, the, the top judge with another man, and he became a believer and left. He took 180 of them with him. And he's barely mentioned in the Talmud anymore, but he's also prominent in the book of Acts, I believe. It says, these, therefore, arose among the former people, and now the evil one who is wise to do mischief, and as for goodness, knows no such good thing, has cast out some from among us, and has wrought by them heresies and schisms. Whence heresies spring from? And this is where the beginning of the heretical opinion started during the apostolic times, as it's called. You'll find the reference for this in the book of Acts a little bit, and then it's gone over in much greater detail in what's called the recognitions of Clement or the Clementine homilies, which are two similar writings, but they're not exactly the same. It's based on the teaching and preaching of Kepha, which was recorded by Clement and sent to Yaakov, the overseer of the Yerushalayim assembly, who was instructed or who taught, worked with the elders there and did not make it publicly known. It's not in scripture because it was meant for the teachers and those that were going to be spreading the good news and being instructing or instructing others for their soul's sake, if you will. It wasn't meant for everyone to just have his writings to pervert them. You can find that if you look at Jackson Snyder's version of the recognitions of Clement, it has an appendix at the back where, which has the letters of the doctrine of reserve, the letter that Kepha wrote to Jacob, and then the decision to keep it out of the common scriptures. But again, that's very worthy stuff to read and test for yourself. And you find in detail the heresies that Shimon brought up in his first interactions with Kepha as he's spreading the heretical doctrine from the land up north into Europe. It says, now the original of the new heresies began this way. The devil entered into one Shimon of a village called Geti, or Getai, a Samaritan, by profession a magician, and made him the minister of his wicked design. Acts chapter 8. For when Philippos, or Philip, our fellow emissary, by the gift of Yahuwah and the energy of his Ruach, performed the miracles of healing in Samaria, insomuch that the Samaritans were affected and embraced the Amuna, or belief, of the Elohim of the creation and of Yahuwah Yahushua, and were immersed into his name, nay, and that Shimon himself, when he saw the signs and wonders which were done without any magic ceremonies, fell into admiration, and believed, and was immersed and continued in fasting and prayer. We heard of the favor of Elohim, which was among the Samaritans by Philip, and came down to them. And enlarging much upon the word of doctrine, we laid our hands upon all that were immersed, 
and we conferred upon them the participation of the Ruach. Yet when Shimon saw that the Ruach was given to believers by the imposition of our hands, he took money and offered it to us, saying, Give me also the power that on whomsoever I also shall lay my hand, he may receive the Ruach of Elohim, or the set-apart Ruach, rather. And that would be Acts 8, verse 19. Being desirous that as the devil deprived Adam by his tasting of the tree of that immortality which was promised him, so also that Shimon might entice us by the receiving of money, and might thereby cut us off from the gift of Elohim, that so by exchange we might sell to him for money the inestimable gift of the Ruach. But as we were all troubled at this offer, I, Kepha, with a fixed attention on that malicious serpent which was in him, said to Shimon, Let your money go with you to perdition, because you have thought to purchase the gift of Elohim with money. You have no part in this matter, nor lot in this belief, for your heart is not right in the sight of Elohim. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray to Yahuwah, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of inequity. Yet then Shimon was terrified and said, I entreat you. Pray to Yahuwah for me, that none of those things which you have spoken come upon me. Acts 8.24 Who were the successors of Shimon's impiety, and what heresies they set up? But when we went forth to the nations to preach the word of life, then the devil wrought in the people to send after us false emissaries to the corrupting of the word. And they sent forth one Cleobius, who joined with Shimon. And these became disciples of one Docetius, whom they, despising, put him down from, their or from the principality. And this part is mentioned in the recognitions of Clement, when Clement's older brothers, Nasita and Achilla, as they were known later on, but Fastinius and Fastus, as they were named from birth, they were with Shimon when he was joining this group, which was a lunar cult, if you will. And he put down the leader to take control of it, and he called himself the standing one. But moving back on. Afterwards, also, others were the authors of absurd doctrines. Serinthus who at the time of Yahukanon, later on when he, was, when he was writing his epistles, and when he was banished and wrote Revelation, Serinthus was the current leader of the Nicolaitans at that time. He's also written about by Irenaeus, or Irenaeus possibly mentioned by others. But Serinthus and Marcus and Menander and Balisades and Saturnil or Saturnilus, <clears throat> excuse me, of these, some owned the doctrine of many mighty ones, or Elohim, some only of three, but contrary to each other without beginning, and ever with one another, and some of an infinite number of them, and those unknown ones also. And some reject marriage, and their doctrine is that it is not the appointment of Elohim and others abhor some kinds of food. Some are impudent in uncleanness, such as those who are falsely called Nicolaitans. See, it mentions falsely called, and they do the same thing where they tampered with um, the writings of Ignatius because they didn't want to associate the Nicolaitans with a real heretical sect. But it was real. And it's mentioned the Nicolaitans were the ones that Yahushua hated in Revelation. It was the ones that would be usurping his believers in, in what they call Catholicism today. It was the Nicolaitan movement back then. And Shimon meeting me, Kepha, first at Caesarea Stratanos, 
where the trustworthy Cornelius, a Gentile, believed on Yahuwah Yahushua by me, endeavored to pervert the word of Elohim. There being with me the set-apart children, Zakai, who was once a publican or tax collector, and Barnabas and Nesetus and Achilla, brethren of Clement, the overseer and citizen of Rome, who was the taught one of Kepha and Shaul, our fellow emissary and fellow helper in the good news, or Besora. I thrice discoursed before them with him concerning the true foreteller and concerning the monarchy of Elohim. And when I had overcome him by the power of Yahuwah and had put him to silence, I drove him away into Italy. And this is what you can read. The three discourses that he had in Caesarea are the beginnings of the disputes that are in the recognitions of Clement and in the homilies. It says, How Shimon, desiring to fly by some magical arts, fell down headlong from on high at the prayers of Kepha and break his feet and hands and ankle bones. It says, Now when he was in Rome, he mightily disturbed the assembly and subverted many and brought them over to himself and astonished the nations with his magic or with his skill in magic. Insomuch that once in the middle of the day, he went into their theater and commanded the people that they should bring me also by force into the theater and promised he would fly in the air. And when all the people were in suspense at this, I prayed by myself. And indeed, he was carried up into the air by demons and did fly on high in the air, saying that he was returning into Shemaim or heavens and that he would supply them with good things from thence. Now, you, you see magicians like David Blaine and others, they'll do levitation. This was very similar, but demons can allow you to fly. It was prominent also in the 1800s when spiritists and doing seances became very public. There was people known to be flying around out windows and different things like that. Magic still exists. There's some pretty good evidence of it. Um, but it goes into detail about those again in the recognition of Clement. The things that he's able to do are quite like what you can see David Copperfield doing for show and entertainment to delude people. And it is demons that allow such things. Magic is the mockery of the gifts of the Ruach from our creator. This is, and the people making acclamations to him as to a mighty one, I stretched out my hands to Shemaim and with my mind and besought Elohim through Yahuwah Yahushua to throw down this pestilent fellow and to destroy the power of those demons that made use of the same for the seduction and perdition of men. To dash him against the ground and bruise him, but not to kill him. And then fixing my eyes on Shimon, I said to him, If I be a man of Elohim and a real emissary of Yahushua Mashiach and a teacher of piety, and not of deceit as you are, Shimon. I command the wicked powers of the apostate from piety, by whom Simon the magician is carried, to, go, to let go their hold, that he may fall down headlong from his height, that he may be exposed to the laughter of those that have been seduced by him. When I had said these words, Shimon was deprived of his powers and fell down headlong with a great noise and was violently dashed against the ground and had his hip and ankle bones broken. And the people cried out, saying, There is one Elohim, or one only Elohim, whom Kepha rightly preaches in truth. So just like how Eliyahu was given signs to do in front of the people and they they profess the truth of Yahuwah Elohim alone instead of Baal. He declared publicly these things and then had that happen so that the people that were reasonable would declare that Yahuwah is true and there's no power of magic that is greater than him.
And many left him, but some who were worthy of perdition continued in his wicked doctrine. And after this manner, the most atheistical heresy of the Simonians was first established in Rome, and the devil wrought by the rest of the false emissaries also. How the heresies differ from each other and from the truth. Now all these had one and the same design of atheism, to blaspheme El Shaddai, to spread their doctrine that he is an unknown being, and not the father of Mashiach, nor the creator of the world, but one who cannot be spoken of, ineffable, not to be named, and begotten by himself. That we are not to make use of the law and of the foretellers, that there is no providence and no resurrection to be believed, that there is no judgment nor retribution, that the inner being is not immortal, that we must only indulge our pleasures and turn to any sort of worship without distinction. Remember, all these are heresies. These are errant things that were brought in. All right. Some of them say that there are many Elohim, some that there are three Elohim without beginning, or three co-equal, co-eternal, which is exactly the doctrine that was brought in by Sixtus the Third, the six 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 foretold in Revelation. He was the sixth, or he was the third Sixtus that was named the overseer of the Roman Assembly, and he was the one that was foretold to bring about the abomination of desolation. He put together the codified laws that later became known as the Theodosian, or was compiled in the Theodosian Codex, and later was um, administered in the Edict of Thessalonica. And part of that doctrine was to keep December 25th as the Christ Mass, to call themselves Catholic Christians, and to believe in the three co-eternal, co-equal Trinity doctrine. And anyone who did not believe that would be punished by the government of Rome. It says some that there were, or there are two unbegotten Elohim, some that there are innumerable aeons. Further, some of them teach that men are not to marry and must abstain from flesh and wine, affirming that marriage and the beginning of children and the eating of certain foods are abominable, that so as sober persons, they may make their wicked opinions to be received as worthy of belief. And some of them absolutely prohibit the eating of flesh or meat, as being the flesh not of brute animals, but of creatures that have a rational inner being, as though those that ventured to slay them would be charged with the crime of murder. And you see, that's even a doctrine that's being promoted today amongst believers. It, it's a heretical doctrine that's contrived by Satan, because it's contrary to what you can read in the word as is everything that's already been mentioned. Yet others of them affirm that we must only abstain from swine's flesh, but may eat such as are clean by the law, and that we ought to be circumcised according to the law, and to believe in Yahushua as in a set-apart man and a foreteller, but not as Elohim, right? But others teach that men ought to be impudent in uncleanness, and to abuse the flesh, and to go through all unrighteous practices, as if this were the only way for the inner being to avoid the rulers of this world. Now all these are the instruments of the devil and the children of wrath. All right, so this is section three. The heresies attacked by the emissaries or apostles, an exposition of the preaching of the sent ones. Yet we who are the children of Elohim and the sons of Shalom do preach the set apart and right word of piety and declare one only El, Yahuwah of the law and of the foretellers, the maker of the world 
the father of Mashiach, not a being that caused himself or begot himself as they suppose, but eternal and without original. Kepha, in the recognitions of Clement, there is a section, there's 10 chapters in the beginning of book three that were not translated into English from the Greek translation that's in the anti-Nicene volumes or the, the 10 books of the anti-Nicene writings, they call it, or the pre-Nicene council writings. They weren't translated. The author said that they're utterly unintelligible and not of the best authority and this and that because they believed in the Trinity and it absolutely refutes it. But in the Syriac version, which came out not too long ago, it was found and translated into English. The author did translate that section into English, and you can read about it. In there, Kepha calls the father the self-existent one who did not come into being. That's the title he uses over and over again to identify the father. Our Mashiach is the first begotten of creation, but the father is without beginning. So there is only one eternal Elohim. He made our Mashiach first of all, and through him was pleased to make all things. And that's very explained very well in that section. But it says, but eternal and without original and inhabiting light inaccessible, not two or three or many fold, but eternally one only. Not a being that cannot be known or spoken of, but who was preached by the Torah and the foretellers, Hashadai, or the Almighty, the supreme governor of all things, the all-powerful being, the El and Father of the only begotten and of the firstborn of the whole creation, one El, the father of one Ben, or son, not of many, the maker of one comforter by Mashiach, the maker of the other orders, the one creator of the several creatures by Mashiach, which if you've ever seen the breakdown of that word, Mashiach in Hebrew, it's literally the means or the place of discourse and communication. It's the place of words. It is the, it is the gift in containment or in a container there's so much in his name alone or that word mashiach alone which is why i use that instead of saying christ or messiah if you will christ is from christos which is a greek word that's an equivalent it means anointed but mashiach means so much more and one of those things is literally the means of discourse and communication or meditation which is what our creator did when he spoke through our mashiach and all things came to be it was his will, the Mishiach is the one that spoke, and the Ruach went and did his works through his word. This is the same, the preserver and legislator by him, the cause of the resurrection and of the judgment and of the retribution which shall be made by him, that this same Mashiach was pleased to become man and went through life without sin and suffered and rose from the dead and returned to him that sent him. We also say that every creature of El is good, Genesis 1, and nothing abominable, meaning you don't become unclean by touching the dead carcass of a pig anymore or touching anything not of with fins and scales in the water. Be, those were added bonds because of transgression to teach men righteousness because everything in creation I was, it's mentioned in the odes of, of, they call it the odes of Solomon, the odes of Shalomo. They have the odes in the Psalms, but they weren't written by him. The Psalms were written beforehand, but the odes were written contemporary with the, the emissaries. It was written by a Gentile believer. And in there, he mentions that, <clears throat> excuse me. He mentions that all the works, all the, the worlds, this world and the world to come, are the interpreters of his words and the instructors of the works of his hand, meaning that all of creation teaches man righteousness, which is mentioned elsewhere as well. 
but it was all meant to teach men righteousness by the instructions that he was giving. It's not something that was going to continue forever because it didn't have its beginning from eternity. That's another thing that he points out. But he says, and nothing abominable, that everything for the support of life, when it is partaken of righteously, is very good. And this would be Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, and 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Some things are for food, some things are not food, but all are for man's use as he, as he pleases. You can use, there's benefits to all creatures. They have things that you can use them for. You can ride a horse and use it for labor, for example. Same thing with sea creatures. They have benefits that you can use them for. So is very good for according to the scripture, all things were very good. Genesis 1, 31. I put a footnote here because they, they try to promote that you can eat all things and that's nothing that's never said. We, we're not to go and add to or take away from his word and we're not to go beyond what is written. So you'll never find anywhere where he's made all things food or permissible for his believers to eat. It says, we believe that lawful marriage and the beginning of children is honorable and undefiled. For the differences of sexes was formed in Adam and Hua for the increase of mankind. We acknowledge with us an inner being that is incorporeal and immortal, not corruptible as bodies are, but immortal as being rational and free. This is also explained in Josephus' discourse to the Greeks on Hades, in what our brother Paul was mentioning earlier in 4th Ezra or 2nd Ezdraeus, chapter 7, what happens when you die, your soul or your inner being, being immortal, does not die. It's presented before the Father, and you're either confounded and terrified or horrified in seven different ways for your wicked disposition and the torment that you have in store for you, or you are assured and joyful and in shalom for your pleasant disposition and obedience to your maker. And you, then you have a week to look at creation as it is. And then you go to your habitation, either by the lake of, or by the lake of fire or in the dwelling place of the righteous, where they're at shalom and resting until the resurrection. It says, we abhor all unlawful mixtures and that which is practiced by some against nature as wicked and impious. We profess there will be a resurrection both of the righteous and unrighteous and a retribution. We profess that Mashiach is not a mere man, but El Dabar, or El the Word, and man, the mediator between Elohim and men the high Kohen of the Father. Nor are we circumcised with the Yahudim, as knowing that he has come to whom the inheritance was reserved, Genesis 49.10, and on whose account the families were kept distinct. The expectation of the nations, Yahushua Mashiach, who sprang out of Yahuda, the sun from the branch, the flower from Yeshai, whose government is upon his shoulder. And I put a, a footnote here. It says, see that this was foretold in Yahushua, like the what they call Joshua, the book, but Yahushua 5, 1 through 9, the fact that they weren't going to be circumcised while he was with them in the wilderness, and they weren't circumcised until he brought them back into the land, was foreshadowed in the children that, at that time. All the men of battle who were circumcised were slain and died in the wilderness. You also see it foretold of by Ezra in 4th Ezra chapters 1 and 2, that the circumcision of the flesh would be put away. It's also mentioned in Deuteronomy and a few other places that he wants us to have a circumcised heart, right? And then you have Galatians 5, where Shaul's mentioning that those that become circumcised of the Gentiles or of the nations at that time would be cutting themselves off from the favor of Mashiach because it was not to be done anymore, as it was foretold that they would not do so in the wilderness. So 
that's the context for it. And this is why it says, he mentioned specifically, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but doing the commands of Elohim. And the fact that our Mashiach has the right to give commands that are no longer applicable or different from ones that came before, you see examples of it in scripture to begin with. First, all food was, or first food was only vegetables and fruit, and then he gave them meat to eat, and then he prohibited certain meats for his people. And, and later on, there will be no more death and we'll all be vegetarians again. It, it will happen. At one point, there was no circumcision, and then he gave circumcision, and now he's taken it back. And at one point again, everyone's going to be circumcised. There will be no new, no, there will be no shedding of blood. There will be no new births, right? Things that are established, he can change, and he does so as he wills for his purposes. That's the point to get across. But there's a lot of people that want to say that we have to circumcise and do things like that. But it's not possible. You can't even keep the, if you did, you'd have to do the sacrifices for it, which no one can do. We don't have a temple and it's not permissible to just slaughter anywhere. It's never been permitted. So it, there was places where believers before the temple was built or before his people were made a nation, they could build altars wherever they wanted and offer to him. But afterwards, there was one place where he designated that you can do so. And that place changed over time a few places as well. So people like to get hung up on these things, but the, if we think clearly and rationally about what actually is in scripture, you can see that there's nothing incongruent with these things. I myself am circumcised before I knew better, right? Most of my children are, not my youngest, because then I knew not to do it. So, and that's how we all have to be. As we hear, conform ourselves to his will and do what's right. And then he finds that as a pleasing and he forgives us. Love covers a multitude of sins for anyone who's in doubt of that. But moving on. <clears throat> it says, for those that confess Mashiach, but are desirous to circumcise. Yet because this heresy did then seem the more powerful to seduce men, and the whole assembly was in danger, we the twelve assembled together at Yarushalayim. For Matit Yahu was chosen to be a sent one in the room of the betrayer and took the lot of Yahuda, as it is said, his office let another take. So, and this is also foretelling of the 12 that followed the truth, Yahuda betrayed him and was cast away. And Matit Yahu, or the gift of Yahuwah, was what replaced him. The tribe of Yahuda rejected the truth by and large and were cast away. But the gift of Yahuwah was those of the nations that turned to him and were accepted. So, Ab willing, you guys can see the foretellings and parables, both in the lives of the men and the larger scale of things. It literally happens all throughout his work. This is, we deliberated together with Yaakov, the, the master's brother, what was to be done. And it seemed good to him and to the elders to speak to the people words of doctrine. For certain men likewise went down from Yahuda to Antioch, where the Nicolaitan movement was birthed at and became prominent. That's also where Nicholas the emissary, or not the emissary, sorry, Nicholas the uh, deacon or minister was from originally. He says, and taught the brethren who were there saying, unless you are circumcised after the manner of Moshe and walk according to the other customs which are or which he ordained, you cannot be delivered. Acts 15, verse 1. When, therefore, there had been no small dissension and disputation, the brethren which were at Antioch, or with the brethren which were at Antioch, when they knew that we were all met together about this question, sent out unto us men who were trustworthy and comprehending in the scriptures to learn concerning this question. And they, when they had come to Yerushalayim, declared to us what questions were arisen in the assembly of Antioch, namely, that some said men ought to be circumcised and to observe the other purifications. And when someone, or when some said one thing and some another, 
Ikepha stood up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that from ancient days Elohim made choice among you, that the nations should hear the word of the good news by my mouth, and believe. And Elohim, which knows the hearts, bear them witness. Acts 15, 7 and 8. For a messenger of Yahuwah appeared. Sorry about that. For a messenger of Yahuwah appeared on a certain time to Cornelius, Acts 10, who was a centurion of the Roman government, and spoke to him concerning me, that he should send for me and hear the word of life from my mouth. He therefore sent for me from Jaffa, or what they call Jaffa, to Caesarea Stratanos, and when I was ready to go to him, I would have eaten, and while I made ready, or while they made ready, I was in the upper room praying, and I saw the Shamayim opened, and a vessel knit at the four corners like a splendid sheet let down to the arets or earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things of the earth and fowls of the Shamayim. And there came a voice out of Shamayim to me, saying, Arise, Kepha, slay and eat. And I said, By no means, Master, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And there came a voice a second time, saying, What Elohim has cleansed, call not common. And this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into Shamayim. Yet, as I doubted what this vision should mean, the Ruach said to me, Behold, men seek you, but rise up and go your way with them, nothing doubting, for I have sent them. These men were those which came from the centurion. And so by reasoning, I comprehended the word of Yahuwah, which is written, Whosoever shall call on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. Yahuel 2.32 And if you remember, it mentions in the book of Acts that Cornelius would regularly pray and fast to our creator, and he had belief in him. So he was of the nations that called on him, and he was delivered, him and his household. And again, all the earth, or all the ends of the earth, shall remember and turn unto Yahuwah, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For the kingdom is Yahuwah's, and he is the governor of the nations. Psalm 22, 27 through 28. Now, this right here is another great example of the all being a quantitative and not qualitative. It is not literally every last person or every last family throughout the whole earth that turned to him and returned and remembered, but it was of all types. All peoples of all nations have become believers. And at some point, every knee will bow and all will confess Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, but that's not. Uh, that's not willingly of their own volition. So you have to use context and do the same thing Kepha did. By reason and truth, comprehend the word, not just blatantly believing whatever you read and what people might say about it. And observing that there were expressions everywhere concerning the calling of the nations, I rose up and went with them and entered into the man's house. And while I was preaching the word, the set-apart Ruach fell upon him and upon those that were with him, as it did upon us at the beginning. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by belief. And I perceived that Elohim is no respecter of persons, but that in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness will be accepted with him. But even the believers which were of the circumcision were astonished at this. Now, therefore, why do you tempt Elohim to lay an heavy yoke upon the neck of the taught ones, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Yet by the favor of Yahuwah we believe and shall be delivered. 
or we believe we shall be delivered even as they. For Yahuwah has loosened us from our bonds and has made our burden light and has loosed the heavy yoke from us by his clemency. While I spoke these things, the whole multitude kept silence. But Yaakov, the master's brother, answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Shimon has declared how Elohim at first visited to take out a people from the nations for his name. And to this agree the words of the foretellers. As it is written, Afterwards I will return and will raise again and rebuild the tabernacle of Dawid, which is fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and will again set it up, that the residue or the remnant of men may seek Yahuwah, or seek after Yahuwah, and all the nations upon whom my name is called, says Yahuwah who does these things. Amos 9, 11 and 12. Now, in one of the Peshars or the interpretations, it might actually be the exhortation in the Damascus document for the Dead Sea Scrolls. It quotes the tabernacle of Dawid being fallen down and gives the interpretation of it that it's being his people and the laws and everything. So it's an interesting connection there. I don't exactly remember which one it is. I'll have to find that and I'll share it in the comments as well. It says, Known unto El are all his works from the beginning. I'm sorry, someone going to say something? No? Okay. Sorry about that. Known unto El are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we do not trouble those who from among the nations turn unto Elohim, but to charge them that they abstain from the pollutions of the nations and from what is sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication which laws were given to the ancients who lived before the law, under the law of nature, Enosh, Chanak, Noach, Melchizedek is our Mashiach, but it's quite often they want to promote that with Shem or some other person. However, you can find in, just in the common scriptures, between what's there, no mother and father, no genealogy made like the son of, of Elohim. And without beginning or without uh, end lives an ageless life as explained by Shaul, right? And as mentioned in the Psalms, then you have the reference in Yobelim, which was completely removed. And then you have all these places where they put Melchizedek as a man trying to put it off. But if you look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's something called the visions of Amram. And while it's in fragments, one of those visions that he had was of two that were fighting over him. It was Malkirasha, the king of evil, and Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. And that was our Mashiach, or the prince of light, who's over the children of light. And every man gets to choose who they have as their, their leader. It says, Yob, and if there be any other of the same sort that it seemed good to us that the sent ones and to Yaakov, the overseer, and to the elders with the whole assembly to send men chosen from among our own vessels with Barnabas and Shaul of Tarsus, the emissary of the nations, and Yahuda who was called Barsaba or Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and wrote, by their hand as follows. The emissaries and elders and brethren to the brethren of Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia of the nations send greeting. Since we have heard that some from us have troubled you with words, subverting your inner beings, to whom we gave no such commandment, it has seemed good or pleasing to us when we were met together with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Shaul, 
men that have hazarded their lives for our Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, by whom you sent unto us, we have also, or we have sent also with them Yahuda and Silas, who shall themselves declare the same things by mouth. For it seemed to, to the Kodesh Ruach and to us to lay no other burden upon you than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, because it gives demons jurisdiction over you and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which things, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Farewell. Now remember the soul or the nefesh. It says in scripture, the life is in the blood. But if you look at the Hebrew, that word is not the word for life, which is chai or chayim, but it's the word for soul, nefesh. The nefesh is in the blood. And that's why you're not to, to eat it or consume it. When you strangle something, you don't let the blood drain out. Okay. And then fornication is the reason why the flood happened. It's where men aren't keeping their promiscuous and just sleeping with whomever they want. We accordingly sent this epistle, but we ourselves remained in Yerushalayim many days consulting together for the public benefit for the well-ordering of all things. That we must separate from heretics. But after a long time, we visited the brethren and confirmed with them, or sorry, and confirmed them with the word of piety and charged them to avoid those who, under the name of Mashiach and Moshe, war against Mashiach and Moshe. And in the clothing of sheep, hide the wolf. And these would be the Gnostics and the heresies that were brought up during that time that have continued even to this day. You can find more about this in Irenaeus or Irenaeus' Against Heresies. So five books. And also Hippolytus' uh, Refutation of All Heresies. Um, Justin Martyr has some writings on it too, but I'm not as familiar with those. And this section right here, it, it all covers the errant opinions that are contrary to the truth. It says, for these are false messiahs and false prophets and false apostles, deceivers and corruptor, corruptors, portions of foxes. Many of the modern scriptures will call them jackals. Whenever you read about the jackals there, it's usually the word for foxes. And it was like what our Mashiach called Herod, that fox, someone who takes the dwelling that doesn't belong to them and usurps it. That's what the, uh, <clears throat> the Counter-Reformation has been doing as well. And there's actually some writings on them where they're like the firebrands or the foxes that had their tails tied together and they burn through all the fields and destroy the, the seed, if you will. Which was uh, something that was foreshadowed in Judges by samson and what he did with the philistines there he was of the tribe of dan again all of these things are important for telling things that would happen later on right but it says the destroyers of the herbs of the vineyards song of solomon 2 15 for whose sake the love of many will wax cold but he that endures steadfast to the end the same shall be delivered matith yahoo 24 12 through 13 and this is also foretold that from the ancient history of Caledonia, McIsaac's deathbed foretelling, which I believe we've I've shared with you before. Concerning whom, that he might secure us, Yahuwah declared, saying, There will come to you men in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Take care of them. For false Mashiachim, or Messiahs, and false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Who are the preachers of the Yechad doctrine? That, that word Yechad is very interesting, but it means to be united into one. It's what is unfortunately translated as Catholic, which Catholic is universal, but this is to be united into one. One body, one mind, one Ruach, one Mashiach, one Elohim, 
one law, one way, one truth, right? And everyone all in agreement with it. That is the Yahad doctrine or the Yahad Kahal assembly or congregation, if you will. It's also prevalent. This word is exclusively used for the assemblies as in the Dead Sea Scrolls for the community rule and the Damascus document. They're called the Yahad. But it's we who are the preachers of the Yahad doctrine and which are the commandments or which are the commandments given by them. On whose account also we who are now assembled in one place, Kephi, or Kepha and Andari, Yaakov and Yahukanan, the sons of Zabadee, Philippos and Bartholomew, which I, I didn't know this until more modern times, but this is actually Bartholomew is the son of Ptolemy. And that's a Hebrew name, but Ptolemy is a Greek name, like the Ptolemies of Egypt were the kings of Egypt during the Greek reign over them. Anyways, Toma and Matith Yahu, Yaakov, the son of Alpheus, and Labius, or Labanus, right, who is surnamed Thaddeus, and Shimon the Zealot, Matith Yahu 10 2. And Matith Yahu, who instead of Yahuda was numbered with us, and Yaakov, the brother of the master, and overseer of Yarushalayim, and Shaul, the teacher of the nations, the chosen vessel. If you remember, the Testament of Benjamin, or Benjamin as they call it, is the first known foretelling of when Shaul would be, would be about. He was directly foretold to be specifically chosen by our Mashiach. And he was the one, you can read in Acts where he was chosen and he called him out. It said he would hear his voice on the earth and do his will and spread the good news to the nations. Uh, it was mentioned by Benjamin in his testament. And then it's foreshadowed in the life of Dawid with the son of Shaul, Yahu Nathan, how they make a covenant with one another. And while Yahu Nathan dies, he takes in his crippled son and, and brings him to his table. Right? All of that was foreshadowing the promise that was given and then the fulfillment, which is in him. But it says, the chosen vessel, having all met together, have written to you this Yahad doctrine for the confirmation of you, to whom the oversight of the Yahad Kahal, or united into one assembly, is committed. Wherein we declare unto you that there is only one El Shaddai, besides whom there is no other, and that you must worship and adore him alone, through Yahushua Mashiach, our Yahuwah, in the most set apart Ruach that you are to make use of the set-apart scriptures, the Torah and the foretellers, to honor your parents, to avoid all unlawful actions, to believe the resurrection and the judgment, and to expect the retribution, and to use all his creatures with thankfulness as the works of Elohim, and having no evil in them, to marry after a lawful manner, for such marriage is unblameable. For the woman is suited to the man by Yahuwah, Proverbs 19.14. And Yahuwah says that he made them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Matthew Yahu 19.4 and 5. Nor let it be esteemed lawful after marriage to put her away who is without blame. For says he, You shall not, or you shall take care to your ruach, and shall not forsake the wife of your youth, for she is the partner of your life and the remains of your ruach. I and no other have made her. Malachi 2.15 For Yahuwah says, What Elohim has joined together, let no man put asunder. Mark 10, 9. For the wife is the partner of life, united by El, unto one body from two. But he that divides that again into two, which has become one, is the enemy of the creation of Elohim and the adversary of his providence. 
In like manner, he that retains her that is corrupted is a transgressor of the Torah of nature, since he that retains an adulteress is foolish and impious. For, says he, cut her off from your flesh, for she is not an help, but a snare, bending her mind from you to another. Proverbs 18.22 nor be circumcised in your flesh, but let the circumcision which is of the heart by the Ruach suffice for the trustworthy. For he says, be circumcised to your Elohim, and be circumcised in the foreskin of your heart. And that's in Deuteronomy. That we ought not, or sorry, that we ought not to re-immerse or re-baptize, if you will, nor to receive that baptism which is given by the unrighteous, which is not immersion, but a pollution. And in a different section of the Apostolic Constitutions, it actually goes over everything that an instructed or someone who's initiated needs to be taught, and then what you're to do when you are immersed to renounce Satan and to who's supposed to immerse you. It's all covered. So very important to read that for everyone who wants to do so. But it says, be likewise contented with one immersion alone, that which is into the death of the master, not that which is conferred by wicked heretics, but that which is conferred by unblameable kohanim, or ministers, right? in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the set-apart Ruach. And a lot of people use this kind of thing to prove the Trinity, but it's talking about his name is of the Father, because the Father's name is Yahuwah. The name was given to his Son by inheritance. He inherited the name above every name, and it's called the Ruach of Yahuwah throughout Scripture, because he's the creator, owner, possessor, and distributor of it. So, it, that's the name of the three, not three in one. And that's from Matthew Yahu 28, 19. And let not that which comes from the unrighteous be received by you, nor let that which is done by the righteous be disannulled by a second. For as there is one El, one Mashiach, and one Comforter, and one death of the Master in the body, so let that immersion which is unto him be but one. But those that receive polluted baptism from the unrighteous will become partners in their opinions. For they are not Kohanim. For Elohim says to them, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from the office of Kohen to me. Hosea, or Husha, right? Husea, 4.6. Nor indeed are those that are immersed by them initiated, but are polluted, not receiving the remission of sins, but the bond of impiety. And besides they that attempt to baptize those already initiated, impale the master afresh, slay him a second time, laugh, El, or laugh at El and ridicule set-apart things, affront the Ruach, dishonor the set-apart blood of Mashiach as common blood, are impious against him that sent, him that suffered, and him that witnessed. It should be her that witnessed if you want to be completely accurate, because the Ruach is given the feminine throughout the scriptures. It's only in the renewed covenant that it's called a he, because spirit is Latin and it's a masculine. Spiritus is a masculine form. Ruach is feminine. When you go throughout the Proverbs or you're reading about wisdom throughout Sirach and the other places, the wisdom of Shalomo, it's called a she. And when it's explained by Kepha in the 10 chapters of book three from the recognitions of Clement in the Syriac version, because it was not translated in the Greek version, she's, it's called a she. But moving on. It says, Nay, he that out of contempt will not be immersed shall be condemned as an unbeliever and shall be reproached as ungrateful and foolish. For Yahuwah says, Unless a man be immersed of water and of the Ruach, he shall by no means 
enter the Malkuth Shemaim, the kingdom of heaven. And that is found in Yahukanon or John 3 5. And again, he that believes and is immersed shall be delivered, but he that believes not shall be damned or condemned. Marcos or Mark 16 16. Yet he that says, when I am dying, I will be immersed. That's what Constantine did, and his son, and then his grandson tried, but died before he could. It says, least I should sin and defile my immersion, is ignorant of Elohim and forgetful of his own nature. For do not delay to turn unto Yahuwah, for you know not what the next yom or day will bring forth. Do you also instruct your infants? Now, this part I put in italics, this is, we're not to immerse babies, right? You, you, don't, you don't immerse someone who can't make the conscious decision to serve your maker. It has to be willing. There's fasting involved. Like, again, if you read the recognitions of Clement, you'll see the examples that were set forth. If you read the Apostolic Constitutions, you'll see the exact way it's supposed to be done. But it has to be a rational decision decision by someone who's choosing to do so i don't know what this originally said but it, don't don't deny your children hearing the word bring them up in nurture and admonition of elohim for says he suffer the little children to come unto me who is the word and forbid them not matthew 1914 concerning books with false inscriptions and this is something that's even prevalent today. You have the, a lot of the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peace, the Gospel of Truth, and some other writings that came out of the Nag Hammadi Library from Egypt, which is literally the, the compilation of the Gnostic writings that were repudiated by the emissaries. But um, they, there was some written even before then that were attributed to Dawid or to others. There's a book of Ido, a book of Gad, and uh, another one that are legitimate. I haven't found the one for Ido yet, but the Book of Gad is is known again. But there's also these books that are written that are heretical. They're absolutely disgusting. So you have books concerning false inscriptions, and the only way you can know is to test it to the truth and confirm it with multiple witnesses, right? This is one witness that points out the errors there. So I'm willing we can learn from this. It says, we have sent all these things to you that you may know our opinion, what it is, and that you may not receive those books which contain or which obtain in our name, but are written by the unrighteous. For you are not to attend to the names of the sent ones, but to the nature of the things and their settled opinions. For we know that Shimon and Cleobius and their followers have compiled poisonous books under the name of Mashiach and of his taught ones, and do carry them about in order to deceive you who love Mashiach and us, his servants. And among the ancients also, some have written apocryphal books of Moshe and of Hanok and Adam, and we have three books of Hanok. The first one was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the other two were not. And if you compare them to the Talmud, just like if you compare the book of Jasher to the Talmud, you'll find that everything that's in error, that disagrees with scripture that's in there, comes from errant sources. But Adam and Yeshiyahu and Dawid and Eliyahu, and of the three patriarchs, meaning Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, pernicious and repugnant to the truth. The same things even now have the wicked heretics done, reproaching the creation, marriage, providence, the beginning of children, the Torah, and the foretellers, inscribing certain barbarous names and, as they think, of angels or messengers, but to speak the truth of demons like Apollyon. The Greeks literally called them demons, and they, they knew that then. They knew that they were wandering spirits, if you will, but they thought they were, you know, they attributed to them the 
the works of our creator too, which was the error that got them in trouble. But which suggest things to them, whose doctrine is shoe or cast away, that you may not be partakers of the punishment due to those that write such things for the seduction and perdition of the trustworthy and unblameable taught ones of Yahuwah Yahushua. Matrimonial precepts concerning ministers. We have already said that a overseer, a elder, and a minister, when they are constituted, must be but once married, whether their wives be alive or whether they be dead, and that it is not lawful for them if they are unmarried, when they are ordained to be married afterwards, or if they be then married to marry a second time, but to be content with that wife which they had when they came to ordination. Now, this is specific to the elders and ministers and overseers of the assembly. They were to be but once married, and they were supposed to be reflecting the truth. Okay? We also appoint that the ministers and singers and readers and porters shall be only once married. But if they entered into the clergy or the kahuna before they were married, we permit them to marry, if they have an inclination thereto. Least they sin and incur punishment. But we do not permit any one of the kahuna to take to wife either a courtesan or a servant or a widow or one that is divorced, as also the Torah says. Let the female minister be a pure virgin, or at the least a widow who has been but once married, trustworthy and well-esteemed. And you can find the instructions for how the kahuna is supposed to be with in regard to women in Leviticus 21.7 and 14, and then the instructions for the, the female servants or ministers is 1 Timothy 5.9, as well as the elders and whatnot, right? You have these instructions in the epistles that were written. An exhortation commanding to avoid the communion of impious heretics. Receive the penitent, meaning those that turn from sin. For this is the will of El in Mashiach. Instruct the instructed in the elements of religion, and then immerse them. Eschew or cast away the atheistical heretics. who are past repentance and separate them from the trustworthy and excommunicate them from the assembly of El and charge the trustworthy to abstain entirely from them and not to partake with them either in sermons or prayers. For these are those that are enemies to the assembly and lay snares for it, who corrupt the flock and defile the heritage of Mashiach pretenders only to hokma and the vilest of men concerning whom shalomo the prudent said the wicked doers pretend to act piously for says he there is a way which seems right to some but the ends thereof look to the bottoms of sheol proverbs 14 12. these are they concerning whom yahuwah declared his mind with bitterness and severity saying that they were false messiahs and false teachers, Matthew 24, 24, who have blasphemed the Ruach of favor and done despite to the gift they had from him after the favor of immersion, to whom forgiveness shall not be granted, neither in this world nor in that which is to come, Matthew 12, 32, Hebrews 6, 4-8, and 10, 26, and 31, or through 31. And this is also the perfect example of Simon the magician. He was immersed, he, he went about with the taught ones, he was fasting and praying, and then he went back about, uh, went back to witchcraft. And how they do that's for another time, but it's disgusting. They, they literally do evil things that are contrary to the, the, what's enjoined for us to do in scripture. And they receive power from Satan by doing the wicked things that our creator says not to. 
It says, who are both more wicked than the Yahudim and more atheistical than the nations who blaspheme the El over all and tread underfoot his son and do despite to the doctrine of the Ruach, who deny the words of El or pretend hypocritically to receive them to the affronting of Elohim and the deceiving of those that come among them, who abuse the set-apart scriptures and as for righteousness, they do not so much as know what it is, who spoil the assembly of Elohim as little foxes do the vineyard. And again, this was the Jesuits, the counter-reformation is atypical of this very thing. It's not all of Catholicism that's involved in the conspiracy to corrupt all believers and protestants everywhere, but it's the Jesuits were the militant arm that were charged with that, and they've hijacked every secret society, and they infiltrated every organization that promotes education and religion to accomplish this goal. And it's like the little foxes that take over the dwelling place of another. <clears throat> Whom we exhort you to avoid, lest you lay traps for your own inner beings. For he that walks with the prudent men shall be prudent, but he that walks with the foolish shall be known. Proverbs 13, 20. For we ought neither to run along with a thief nor put in our lot with an adulterer. Since Kodesh Dawid says, Yahuwah, I have hated them that hate you, and I am withered away on account of your enemies. I hated them with a perfect hatred. They are to me as enemies. Psalms 130, 21, and 22. Now, he was speaking through the inspiration of the Ruach and describing how the truth is towards those who hate our creator, but we're not to hate any man, okay? It's not in us to be returning evil for evil or to revile others. You can see the perfect example of his righteous chosen throughout the book of Fox's, Mar the, the Fox's Book of the Martyrs and how they treated those who were burning them alive and torturing them. They were not requiting evil for evil. They didn't, they loved their enemies, just like our Mishiach enjoined. It says, and El reproaches Yahushaphat with his friendship towards Ahab and his league with him and with Azar Yahu by Yonah the foreteller. Are you in friendship with a sinner or do you aid him that is hated by Yahuwah? For this cause, the wrath of Yahuwah would come upon you suddenly but that your heart is found perfect with Yahuwah. For this cause Yahuwah has spared you, yet are your works shattered and your ships broken to pieces. Second Chronicles 18 through 20. So this is something that we should be mindful of. If we're doing works and joined with people who reject the truth and we're not being successful in our endeavors, it's for this very reason. We're joined to, to the enemies and in friendship with those who hate him. And because of that, his wrath would be upon us, but that we're that our hearts right with him. However, we might be spared, but our works won't be. Ishu or cast away therefore their fellowship and estrange yourselves from their friendship. It says in other places that you don't stop talking to them to for their benefit, but you don't fellowship, you don't hang out, don't buddy-buddy, you don't eat in meals with them, you don't pray with them, you don't go to a ball game with them, okay? We, we're not supposed to do those things, All right? It's like cheating on your wife or going out with uh, someone who hates her. Not It's not something that you ought to do, right? For concerning them did the foreteller declare and say, it is not lawful to rejoice with the unrighteous, says Yahuwah. For these are hidden wolves, dumb dogs that cannot bark, who at present are but few. But in the process of time, when the end of the world draws near, will be more in number and more troublesome. Of whom Yahuwah, or of whom Yahuwah said, will the son of Adam, when he comes, find belief on the earth? Luke 18.8. And because inequity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And this is it right here. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. 
It is not proud. It is not rude. Love keeps no records of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always covers. It always protects. It always endures. And love never fails. If you're not abiding by that, then you're not his. It's very simple. And because people are following after atheistical practices, they're incapable of loving, like he said, which means that if you don't have love, you don't have anything. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You can give all your money to the poor. You can do good works. You can cast out demons. Without love, you're not his. That is the, that is the bar, that is the plumb line, if you will, for identifying believers. You're going to be known by your fruits. And these three remain belief, expectation, and love. But the greatest of these is love. There shall come false messiahs and false prophets, and shall show signs in the Shemaim, so as if it were possible to deceive the elect, from whose deceit Elohim, through Yahushua Mashiach, who is our expectation, will deliver us. For we ourselves, as we pass through the nations and confirm the assemblies, curing some with much exhortation and healing words, restored them again when they were in the certain way of, sorry, to death. And again, this is what you can see in the book of Acts, but more prominently in the recognitions of Clement, where Simon the Magician was going around spreading heretical opinions and doctrines and ruining the belief of some, and Kepha was going around preaching the truth to turn men back to the way. But those that were incurable we cast out from the flock, that they might not infect the lambs which were found with the scabby disease, but might continue before Yahuwah Elohim pure and undefiled, sound and unspotted. And this we did in every city, everywhere throughout the whole world, and have left to you the overseers and to the rest of the Kohanim, or ministers, this very Yechad doctrine, worthily and righteously, as a memorial or confirmation to those who have believed in Elohim. And we have sent it by our fellow minister, Clement, our most trustworthy and intimate son in Yahuwah, together with Barnabas and Timothy, our most dearly beloved son, and the genuine Mark, together with whom we recommend to you also Titus and Luke, and Jason, and Lucius, and Sosipater, Romans 16, 21. These are all people by name that they had made overseers in different areas, okay? Clement, again, is the one who wrote down the apostolic constitutions that they dictated it and then published them and sent them to the different assemblies for the overseers to, to use. It was not meant for everybody in the same way that Kepha's writings were not meant for everybody. This is where it directly mentions Clement wrote this. There's another part in here that does as well. And then in the recognitions, he's the one that was writing them and sending them to Yaakov. It mentions that. And then in what's called the Shepherd of Hermas, when Hermas, who's a overseer or pastor in Rome, if you will, over an assembly there, he was given visions before he was made the pastor. He was given visions. He was spoken to by our Mashiach through the form of the assembly or as the woman, right, in the form of the assembly. And then as our Mashiach himself spoke to him and he received visions and was given commands. And he wrote down the book and made two copies one to give to Clement so he can make and publish it and send it out to the different assemblies like he's already done before, and then one for another man who's going to read it to the widows and the poor in that area. Clement's also known for his letter, First Clement to the Corinthians. There's a second Clement to the Corinthians, but it's, in, it's not complete. And then he has two letters on virginity that were written that are very well, very, very well put together. In there, he clearly says that um, assumption is a work of the flesh, as opposed to proving all things and holding fast to that which is true.
or good, right? All right, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and stop for today, and we'll continue with sections four, five, and six of this next Shabbat, Father willing, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Conveniently enough, this is rather long, and when I had posted this on Facebook years ago, I couldn't post the whole thing. I had to break it off from section four down. <laughs> So it is what it is. Eventually, it wouldn't let me have it. Let me have everything but the section five and, and six on there. But um, you all have a wonderful Shabbat and a wonderful week ahead, and we will see you next time.